Hello and welcome to Deft and Dorky. We're going to talk about Dungeons and Dragons. We're going to talk <laughs> about it. We're not going to play it. We're going to talk about it. So this is hopefully a semi-regular thing that we're going to try to do where we just have a little little show on the channel about that's uh, kind of like a podcast, but it's not going to be on any podcast stuff. It's just going to be here for now. We'll see if that changes. Uh, but Brian's going to do it with me. Uh, we're going to see how this goes. So today we're going to talk hello. about... Hello. <laughs> today we're going to talk about um, mechanics in D&D &D and how to how to use them in storytelling and how the sort of the relationship is between mechanics and storytelling. Uh, I just want to talk about that for a little while. So in sort of thinking about the topic here, one of the things I wanted to talk about was like particular like character creation. So I don't know how you create your characters, but I've gone a few different routes and the the last one that I made was for the Strahd campaign that that, mm -hmm. that you were doing with your family that I sat in on for a, a one shot. And I made a a sorcerer to go to go with it and since it's sort of a I don't know if anyone else knows about what Strahd is, but it's very like it's, it's almost like Transylvania vampires gothic yeah sort of uh setting. So I was mm -hmm going over the the subclasses and i saw the shadow magic and i was like looking through there i was like this seems like it fits in with the campaign and then so i started reading uh about the sort of the the features you get and one of them at six levels hound of ill omen uh which is as a bonus action you can spend some sorcery points to magically summon a hound of ill omen to target a creature that you can see uh within 120 feet the hound then like goes out to them and it attacks only them and it gives you some bonuses. Like, it makes the things next to it have disadvantage on saving throws against your stuff. And I was like, that would be cool if, like, this Hound of Ill Omen was visiting my character in his dreams. Because you don't get it to level 6. Mm -hmm. So I kind of yeah. set it up to have it to where this thing has been visiting my character in his dreams. And at first it scared him. And eventually he sort of has come to a comfortable level with it. And then at sixth level, it was going to manifest, right? So, oh, cool. Yeah. That's just kind of an example uh, about of what I'm talking about. How how do you feel about using mechanics to to tell story, or or vice versa, using storytelling to influence mechanics? Yeah. So I think so for you and I, I think we play a very similar brand of D and D, and I feel that, frankly storytelling and kind of having that immersive experience informs the way that I want to play. So when I start to think about a character that I want to make, I thought I start thinking about like, okay, what are themes? What are ideas that I have? Like what kind of like experiences do I want to kind of flesh out, you know? And so like another example in your campaign, I'm playing this, uh, I'm multi-classing sorcerer warlock and uh, I just hit level three and I've had like my character for the entire campaign that's been going on for over a year. Um, we're level 12 now. Yeah, and so I'm nine. Yeah. Nine sorcerer. And I had two in warlock and we leveled up and I was debating between taking level 10 and sorcerer and I'd get another meta magic. And like, I think another fifth or fourth level spell. I can't remember. Or I could take level three in Warlock, and in that, you take your Pact Boon. Um, and a lot of people will gravitate towards Pact of the Tome for casters, Pact of the Sword if you're doing a Hexblade, um, there's Pact of the Chain if you want, like, an Imp or whatever. Um, and then there's Pact of the Talisman, and Tasha's Cauldron of Everything, I think. Um, and I think a lot of people look down on it as being kind of like a weaker one, because there's just not as many invocations for it yet, and some of them are kind of less optimal or whatever but in our campaign i've had like a, a family heirloom pendant that was kind of central to my character's story as far as getting off the ground in the campaign mm -hmm. and isaac isaac as the dm has i don't i assume you're doing this for the other uh, players as well like you have 
made these things that are important to our characters. Like you've made, you've beefed up the power of the pendant over time. And so I was just like, I don't know that I can pick any pact boon that's not pact of the talisman because <laughs> I've had this very like emotional attachment to this like family heirloom. And so it's kind of it dictated the choice that I made for the pack boon. And I feel like, okay, some people may feel like this is less optimal, but I feel like this is integral to my character and it just fits so perfectly. Um, I mean, it's the same, like even my decision to level into warlock was dictated by the story. The, the act, as far as the patron is concerned, I chose celestial, not because like, Oh, I'm the, party's healer but no i literally have a story driven relationship with this celestial deity so it's just like i i can't like ah, i'm gonna go with fiend because it's pretty strong <laughs> it's like fiend gets fireball <laughs> i mean that would be more optimal but like that is a prime example of you know like a, a mechanic and story relationship uh kind of dictated some of my personal choices so i understand there's arguments against going for something like this but i i kind of think that for me in playing that's the that's the game that i want to play so um i had an idea by the way for okay. as we talk about this um We'll do this in a minute. I want to tease this idea, though, to you. Okay. I was thinking of coming up with examples of how, like, how this can manifest itself. Uh, and so we'll, we'll get to this in a minute. But before we do, um, have you seen examples of this going poorly? Like, utilizing mechanics to, like, dictate the, the story or, like, either within an individual character or for the campaign overall. I don't think that I have. I have... I mean, so... This whole idea is something that I sort of came around to because I found myself already doing it a little bit mm -hmm. uh, when I would, like, make characters or, or make encounters. So, But I haven't seen it really gone poorly, but I think that's due to the fact that I try to come at it from a place where it's going to fit. So yeah. I don't typically like, so I made my, my rogue paladin, uh, multi-class in Michael's campaign, which was... is weird on its own, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> like, uh, the classic rogue paladin will think. So, okay. Well, let me tell you how this works. So I had, yeah, yeah. this was, so this one was the, the most sort of, mechanics driven character that I've made because I saw this come. I was like, that sounds like it would be interesting to play for combat. I would like to do that. So I was like, well, okay, I'm going to start out as a rogue and I have my backstory that, um, I'm this, I'm this guy who was an orphan that got sort of adopted into this, uh, thieves guild. Um, and eventually I found out that, the the guy my father figure who was the leader of this thieves guild was a lot more hardcore than i had anticipated and i wasn't ready for that so i saw him kill someone and i ran mm. away okay. and while i'm like hiding out from everything i meet um this like older woman who runs an inn and she sort of becomes my my mother figure and she uh, like she's fine, but she's like an old maid and she, there's this older man that comes into the inn like daily. Who's like always trying to talk her up. And I'm like, you know, you should like, you don't want to be alone. You should, you should like hang out with this guy. So I start making friends with this guy. Who's, who's a, like an amateur in magic. And he's like showing me all these like, uh, magical books and stuff. And that is how I wrote into my story, my subclass of arcane trickster. So that's where that took off from. And then I knew I wanted to go too into Paladin at some point. So as the, the, the campaign starts and goes on, I start being, uh, I start befriending Joe's character who was a cleric 
Right. And he starts out as a pacifist. So he doesn't attack anything for the first like several sessions. And Oof. I start taking that. I'm like, I can, I really feel for you. Like I sympathize with you not wanting to attack things. Let mm-hmm. me attack things for you. Yeah. And so I tie that into maybe I can get help from your God to help me help you not attack things. And so that ties into my two levels of paladin in with under this, under his goddess. Okay. So like the <laughs> oath you made was specifically to that. I didn't get to level three where you actually make an oath. Oh, that's right. But yeah. like, that is the, that was the, that's what I was looking for is the story tie into how am I going to get there? And the the sort of the, chem, the chemistry that I had with Joe's character worked out well. And I was like, this is perfect. This is how I'm going to work it in. So I love doing that instead of just being like, yeah, I'm going, I'm going paladin next level. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. So yeah, this whole time, important. this whole time I was like making moves to sort of learn more about his God. And eventually I found, uh, we came across a camp where there was a bunch of like, dead soldiers and some of them were, were followers of his God. And I was like, do any of them have a pendant? And Michael's like, mm-hmm. yeah, you can find a pendant easily enough. I was like, can I, I'm going to take one. So now I wear that pendant. And then the next level is when I took my, my multi-class into Paladin. Yeah. So that so is I how, wanna... go ahead. No, you're good. I'll, I'll ask you a question if you're the, well, that was how I, that was the, that was sort of the toughest way that I have gone into the most mechanical coming back to story that I've done. Yeah. I was, I was going to ask you, unless, sorry, unless you're finished with your thought. Go ahead. I was going to ask you, cause earlier you mentioned like, you know, I think it's a good point to make Joe is, I mean, at this point, Joe's character, I assume is engaging in combat now. Yeah. Like eventually there was a, yeah. a, a breaking point where we were getting, beat up and he's like i have to help <laughs> yeah, okay because i think that some some people would give advice that's just like hey it is a bad idea to do like a pacifist character like i think that that would be generally seen as like not awesome but like i'm sure joe made mechanical choices where it's just like every spell that i'm going to take as part of my daily thing as a cleric is going to be support based spells right mm-hmm. yeah, yeah he did he was like I think he was casting like bless and just heals pretty much. Yeah. And and he was doing um, like as far as cantrips, he, I think he was doing a, it was a blade ward, I think is a cantrip. Yeah. So he would cast his blade ward on himself and just like run out in front and put his shield up and try to like shield us from stuff. <laughs> See, and that's interesting too, because I feel like, you know, there's a fine line to walk because I think it's generally bad. Like, <laughs> In the D&D community, this concept of that's what my character would do is considered like kind of a cringy and bad approach <laughs> to playing the game. And yet simultaneously, there is kind of this element of like, hey, I want to make deliberate choices about what's on my character sheet based off of these things. Mm-hmm. Uh, I want to circle back to something that you said, because you mentioned characters, but also encounters. Mm-hmm. Like Isaac's DM'd a lot more than I have. I, I have a little bit of experience, um, but honestly, I'm like probably less than 30 sessions. Um, how have you utilized this in creating encounters? <clears throat> um, so the big one that I like spent the most time on as far as in story wise was Ivia's dungeon, the, uh, the okay. dungeon crawl that you yeah. guys went through with the different rooms. And yeah. the way I sort of went about that was I had this character, Ivia who I mean, as far as anyone else, like the people in within the world think that this character was just a, like a incredible, like wonder kin, wonder kid wizard that just mm-hmm. disappeared out of nowhere. Yeah. And I was like, well, what made her disappear? And, I, and then I was thinking, well, maybe she, maybe she was like her own hubris got her for, from somehow. And so I was like, okay, maybe she has a mansion and maybe she was like trying to keep special artifacts safe. So she makes like a dungeon with these like trials in it so that, because in her mind, she's like very technical. She is, it's, it's not like she's a, a 
sorcerer or anything. She's a, she's been a wizard. She's been studying her whole life, and she's very good at it. So, mm-hmm. how would someone like that set up obstacles? I was like, well, she would she would use whatever knowledge she has, and so all these like encounters were based on someone who would use magic to like to guard something essentially so i had all the like not just like oh there's a monster you got to kill it but there's something more to it some sort of something that's going to the not make it quite that easy and it's all from the mind of someone with like a with with a wizard's mind right someone who thinks about right (laughs) <laughs> who thinks about in character thinks about mechanics. So yeah, yeah, yeah. that's kind of where I came at from that. So the, the, like the first one was just like, you have to kill everything at the same time. Otherwise they, they respawn each other. And then if, if I mean, as you guys went through that, you figure, I mean, I'm not sure if you, I mean, you, you gathered, I guess that she eventually died to her own creation. Right. Yeah. yeah. I mean, and we found her, corpse in yeah, you one find of the corpse room. in there and so and that's sort of to the the point that she was so focused on what she was doing that she forgot and left her key in the treasure room and then she had to go back through her own dungeon to get it oh dang <laughs> i didn't realize that either yeah because i mean the, i guess that the, makes the, sense the, like we the, found the key yeah the ring was in the treasure room and it was supposed to be on her yeah, and she was yeah. like shit I gotta go get yeah. it. Oh, and she's yeah. like, okay, that's fine. Found... I can. I know everything that's in there, and so she made it through everything up until that one point, right? Because she knew all the mechanics, but that last yeah. one, <laughs> those monsters that she created in there, were a little yeah. more powerful than she had anticipated, or just got well, lucky. Especially, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. That was so crazy too. That was such a cool one. That was one of my favorite episodes that we played. Yeah, and that um, that last room. Um, like in all those rooms, I wanted to give everyone something where they could feel like they were the they were the 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 main focus for a minute, right? So the right. first room, it's like whoever can do AOE, right? Right. Because you got to kill them all at the same time. So if you can do AOE, that's that's your room. And then I think the the second one was like the a, a basically like a an, an animated Big B's hand. Mm-hmm. And I had that one was that one didn't work out as as much as I had thought that it might, but I had had some side rules in case you guys wanted to try to take over the hand. Like if, well, I guess it would have been had to have been probably Ray as the only other wizard in the party, but there were some rules to where he could have possibly taken over the hand and used it. And then there was the room that was, everything was quiet. Uh, And if you made any sound, you guys all got electrocuted, right? So I was like, this is going to be where, someone who can subtle spell stuff is going to be very important. <laughs> and then I think you guys you just like muscled through it, right? You sort of did, but you did. You definitely used it. I think you used a subtle spell to teleport over uh, okay. and then uh, Saturn so. link mind linked with you on the other side. Oh, to put yeah, the code. Yeah, yeah. So that was, yeah, you guys had to, you had to communicate without making noise and you had to cast some spells without making noise. You could have done it. Yeah. You, if you wanted to sort of muscle it through, you could have, if you had made high enough stealth checks, you could have moved around in that room normally. Yeah. Uh, or just like, we're going to tank all this damage. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, which you guys were running low at that point. That was yeah, dude. that was a lot. Uh, and then the final room was, I mean, that was the, the final room was the most fun for me because I, I don't know if you watched Doctor Who, but that was like taken straight out of Doctor Who. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, like, it was the 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 darkness was cast in the middle of the room, and I knew only one of you could see through magical darkness. So that was Joe's time, right? Mm-hmm. So he got to yeah. control a lot in that in that fight. And that the mechanics of all those were fun for me to make because all of them sort of served a purpose to tell the story of what each of you is good at. You know, it's funny too. You mentioned subtle spell, like I. I have very intentionally hung on to subtle spell as a meta, meta magic and invisibility as a spell because of something that you and I did in our session zero. Um, 
my character is a wild magic sorcerer. My character in this world that Isaac's made, there's kind of like schools you can go to as like, if you're in this position, like either as a wizard or a sorcerer to kind of hone your craft. And there was a scenario where me and a classmate were, it was very Harry Potter esque, you know, like we're in the restricted section of the library or whatever it was. Mm -hmm. And Isaac had this, like this NPC uh, kind of like pull me over to the side and cast invisibility and kind of like, I (laughs) don't know why this sticks with me so much in my mind. (laughs) He's like, Hey, you know, he, he makes this motion, like, don't say anything, don't move. And he casts the visibility. And in this world, like, if you're in the thick of society, this thing called the Arcane Aegis that Isaac's developed, that's like, essentially the, I don't know how you want to describe it, the, the political slash uh, militarized might, but I don't know, militarized is probably too strong. <laughs> Maybe it's not. Um, the, the authority over magic that kind of governs and runs and enforces laws regarding magic in society. They can detect magic. They can tell when things are happening. They can probably find people that are invisible or whatever, but like this NPC used subtle spell to cast invisibility. So we could actually hide when we were where we were not supposed to be. And to this day, like, I don't think I've cast invisibility once (laughs) and I haven't used subtle spell a whole heck of a lot. Like I will not get rid of those two things because I felt like, oh, that was integral to my character. Like that moment just kind of stuck with me so tightly. And yeah, that's a, that's another um, example of using mechanics for storytelling because so the arcane Aegis, if you're in a city, of Mm -hmm. decent size they have a headquarters and they monitor any magic use within the city and if it's a like basically they're like cops in the speeding trap right if it's a if it's a grievous enough offense they will come and they'll deal with it right so every potentially every magic spell cast in the city is at least taken a look at by the ages and i was like what if i mean because also in my mind magic if it's this big of a tool and it's being used by this many people eventually people have to find counters for it and it goes back and forth so my thought was because i was looking through the meta magic options and i was like subtle spell is kind of cool i don't know if it would ever be used and i was like unless you could use it to subjugate being seen by the ages. <laughs> yeah, totally. So that was what that, that was the whole thing behind that. I was like, I'll use that mechanic as part of this world essentially. So if you, yeah. if you subtle spell something in a city, they won't see it. And it's not just yeah. anyone that can use it. Like this, I made just an NPC, like uh, some friend of yours tell you how to use mm-hmm. subtle spell to get this effect essentially. Right. Because once, once everyone knows about it, then it gets countered essentially. So yeah, totally. <laughs> but I wanted yeah, to give like a, a player, a, a cool mechanic to, to sort of sidestep some of that. And I've used a, a time or two in the city where it's just like, I was able to kind of like circumvent being detected. So yeah, it was kind of, it was kind of a neat moment, which I think is good DM advice. Like if you want to make your, like, I think you should highlight the strengths of your character's PCs and make them feel cool. Like, I know that this is kind of obvious. Well, maybe not so obvious, but like general advice in the D and D community is like, okay, the DM is not in an antagonistic relationship with the players. The DM is like a referee. They're the ones that tell the story. They're the one that put, put on the show in a lot of ways, but it's not us versus them. And I think that like more so you should be on your player's side as much as you can, because like, okay, how can I highlight the strengths that they have? Like I am now running a campaign for some in-person friends um, that we've made here. And like, I was just thinking the other day, like my wife is playing a paladin. Um, I've got a warrior or warrior, uh, <laughs> barbarian. Warrior. We've got a <laughs> <So> barbarian <sad. laughs> and all these tropes, they carry over. 
I've got a paladin, I've got a barbarian, and I've got a druid. And I was kind of like literally looking up online the other day. I was just like, okay, how do I make a paladin feel cool? How do I make a barbarian feel cool? In the Strahd campaign, I did the same thing, and I have a fighter. And I was like trying to think of like, okay, how can I highlight the strengths of a fighter to not only make uh, my player feel awesome, but also like, hey, how do we tell a story with the mechanics that a fighter brings to the table? Because, like, you know, you can think of things like, you know, Subtle Spell, uh, pretty awesome. Uh, monk, like, shoot as many arrows as you can <laughs> at your monks. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> give them a chance to showcase these, like, integral parts of what they are. Yes, um, absolutely. That's, and that's like a, a thing that I feel like gets lost in, like, like a lot of one shots and, little short things because mm. DMs, if it's a, especially if it's a one shot, like a, just a quick, Hey, I got character, like either I have pre-made character sheets for you or just, Hey, roll up a, a, a level three character real quick. And we'll yeah. do this one shot. Those, you don't really get to do that because it takes a while. Like you have to know, you, you basically have to, or the, <laughs> the way I try to do it. I mm-hmm. have, I like to know, my players abilities just as well, if not better than they do so that I can, so that I can set these obstacles in front of them, knowing that there is a way that they can get around them. Right. Sometimes they do it and they feel awesome. Sometimes they miss it. And I'm like, well, that's okay. (laughs) (laughs) You don't say anything. You just let it go. (laughs) I remember our our last campaign. I remember you tried to do that. Um, We had a rogue in the party and they, what was their subclass? Oh, the, sub- the they, they were the uh, assassin. Yeah, and I can't remember the specifics of it, but they have something where they can like imitate someone's voice or like can infiltrate really easily or whatever. Yeah, given <laughs> enough time, they can basically give themselves a fake identity and get them into a yeah. And you guys were in a prison, yeah. and so I set yeah, this we- up so that he could imitate a cop coming in like, Hey, I just got assigned here and then seemingly try to find a way to get you guys out or like right. be the one who transports you. And it just didn't happen. And I was like, well, okay. <laughs> it was really like, and to be honest, like, Oh, I'm going to roll up a rogue subclass assassin. Like, I don't, I don't know if like, Oh, this one thing is something that people think about very often. So I give the player a pass, but it, it was really kind of funny <laughs> in that, in that circumstance too. Like we totally asked for that. Situation. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'll never forget that. Um, yeah. Uh, okay. I, I had an idea Okay. to like highlight this. I was thinking I'm going to pull up D and D beyond. Oops. And I was thinking that we could kind of give a couple of examples of kind of like how to develop a narrative utilizing the mechanics of a particular class or race or whatever. Okay. So we've got, how many classes are there? There are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. Yeah. Um... 14 if you have blood hunter. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to remove Artificer. Okay. Just for... I mean, I don't want to remove Artificer. Uh, I was thinking we could roll a die, and depending on what number came up, that would be the class that we looked at. Okay. Um, yeah, take out Artificer. Cause it's like, that's one of the ones that I am still not as comfortable as I want to be. Right, right. Uh, okay, cool. And then we'll just kind of keep rolling die as we kind of get into the weeds a little bit more. So, I'm pulling up character sheets so I can actually roll some dice here. Okay. There we go. Okay, so I'm going to roll a d12. Alright. Alright, I got an 8. So that is... Uh, one, two, three, four, so five, Ranger? six, seven, eight. Ranger. Okay, this is a perfect example. All right. Rangers have. What are their subclasses called? Uh, Archetypes? Yeah. 
they have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Perfect. <laughs> what a, a lovely D8. number. <laughs> I know, that makes this so easy. All right, four. So, Gloomstalker. one, two, three. Gloomstalker. This is amazing. This is working out so well. And then, <laughs> let me roll. I'll roll. They have four features. Third, seventh, eleventh, and fifteenth level. Okay. How about we roll a d4 and determine which one we got? Okay, two. Perfect. So we're going to look at the seventh level feature. Uh, Iron Mind. Iron Mind. By seventh level, you have honed your ability to resist the mind-altering powers of your prey. You gain proficiency in wisdom saving throws. If you already have proficiency, you instead gain proficiency in intelligence or charisma saving throws. Your choice. Okay. So, and what... I mean, I suppose your race would give you, or your species would give you, proficiency in a wisdom saving throw? Uh, no, that comes from, from classes or feats. Feats, okay. All right. Okay, so I was thinking, like, let's use this as an example. Let's say that you're you're playing a Gloomstalker Ranger and you hit seventh level, and like you want to incorporate this mechanic into your narrative, your story, your background, whatever it is. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was thinking we could come up with a couple of examples of how this could fit into something like that. Okay. You want to go first, or you want me to go first? Uh, I'm doing this super on the fly because we just rolled on it. So if you can, if if something struck out to you, you can go first. I suppose. So, okay. So let's see. Um, the way that this sort of subclass looks to me, because you got like dread ambusher and like you, you're good at like you got umbral sight, you got extra dark vision and stuff. It I would probably play this class as a sort of like almost like a strider from lord of the rings when they first meet him very like hanging out in the back just observing everything yeah yeah so as i'm if once i'm sixth level and i think we're about to start leveling i would like whenever we're going for for downtime or for like long rests or whatever i would start saying you know my character's going to go over and just sort of start meditating a little bit he's going to find a corner put his back in the corner so he can see the entire room and he's going to start just meditating and then when I hit level seven, I'll be like, I think I've found uh, a way to steal my mind from the, all this meditation. Yeah. So okay. that's that's how I, I that's how I think I would do it. Just off yeah. as, as that's my first draft. <laughs> and especially, I mean, like we don't have a campaign, we don't have a character, we don't have a backstory. Like yeah. this is just throwing us in the middle of it. Um, two things kind of came to mind. One, when I so I've been playing with a lot of brand new people and I've been as a fairly new DM DMing for a lot of people that are new to it. I have two brothers that I DM for both very new to this. The friends here, they never played. And so when we, when we've talked about like developing characters, like what kind of class do you play? Um, I think there are helpful questions to help people identify. Cause like, let's be honest, this game is so hard to get your hands around when you're new. Like I remember when you invited me, like this is my playing in last campaign was my first experience with D&D. I spent like two weeks. Like I did the thing that no new player should do. Like I read the player's handbook like <laughs> cover to cover. Like I like, I watched so many videos. I didn't ask for any help at all. Hardly. I just kind of like researched it. It became like, a legitimate academic project. Um, not ideal, unless you are super easily into this kind of stuff like I am. Um, the point that I'm trying to make is that when I'm working with new characters, or new characters, new players, like I'll ask them, like, okay, like, okay, you're playing D&D because you're probably interested in, like, fantasy or games or movies or, like, just kind of nerding out, like, who do you want to be? Like, do you want to be John Wick? Cool. Do you want to be Batman? Awesome. Do you want to be Strider? Like, <laughs> sweet. You know, like, okay, you want to be, uh, you want to be Groot from whatever? Uh, that's the Marvel Universe or whatever? Like, let's, 
let's make you play like a either a druid or a barbarian. You want to be a you know Thor? Like we can do that. Let's be this class or this subclass or whatever. Um, I think this is an example of that where it's just like okay, uh, I'm gonna be a gloom stalker because like I like the idea of being Batman or Strider or whatever. And you get to level seven, and the other bit of advice that I might give when it concerns like, okay, how do you make mechanics a part of your narrative experience is that the writing that these guys, these guys, the, the creators of this game do is pretty impressive. So by seventh level, you have honed your ability to resist the mind altering powers of your prey. Like they didn't have to write that. They could have just written level seven, iron mind. You gain proficiency in wisdom, saving throws, ba ba da 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 da. <laughs> but they give you these like small, bits of flavor text often yeah and so like for me my thought was just like okay i want my gloomstalker to have some kind of like specific the mind altering powers of your prey like who does my gloomstalker hunt uh and what what about them have like maybe you've got a gloomstalker like we're playing Baldur's Gate 3 right now. Like, maybe you have a campaign setting where, like, you're regularly interacting with enemies with psionic powers. Like, you're you're in a world where mind flayers are prevalent or prescient, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I'm going to lean into this idea of, like, okay, from my narrative choice, I hit level 7. I've had these encounters that were kind of harrowing in a big way and i've taken the time to kind of somehow familiarize myself with them and improve my ability to like steal my mind against these particular psychic attacks or whatever so uh that's probably how i would go about it so okay so yeah i like that um that is the kind of thing that I really got into D and D for, because mm-hmm. I, I think I've probably told this story before, but the for my first like experience with with Dungeons and Dragons uh, was with I, I played I think with uh, Michael and some of his friends uh, at one point when I went uh, to visit him, and it was very. Hmm, like my experience was very this would be better as a video game right yeah. because it was the the way that they play is they they do it like i don't I and mean, i don't know for sure because i was i've only played with them like once or twice right but my experience mm-hmm. was that it was very um like roll dice to see what happens yes and then and I was like, that's, I mean, that's cool, I guess, but I, I would rather just, I mean, if, if that is going to be the main thing we do, I'd rather just have a computer take care of all those rules. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and then I started watching Critical Role and I was like, you can play like this? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Where the mechanics serve the story and the main part about the game that you play is the story you tell and the, the role playing you get into and not the sort of tabletop combat simulator mm-hmm. and that's what that's what makes me like dungeons and dragons is because you can yeah. take all these rules and what is great about this is that it's not on a computer is that it's flexible like you yeah. can if you if you see the way a thing is going you can change some things like there's this sort of idea of like the 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 quantum dm right where mm-hmm. your party's like you have a thing that they need to find to go into the next part of the story and it's over it's it's to the right and your your party yeah. goes left and you're like well that thing's go over here now <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> so yeah. and that's like the coolest part that's all that's the video game i've always wanted to play is where your decisions make an impact in what is happening it's and it's not and you and i have talked about this ad nauseum but it's like where you you make a decision and it changes the outcome of what would have happened and not just where as is in most if not all video games you make a decision and it's 
you run into a wall and you're like, Oh, you can't go that way. Right. Like, oh, okay. I guess I'll go this way then. And that's the, that's Even, the cool part about Dungeons and Dragons. Yeah, I agree with that. Even the elute, like there is a choice for so many games nowadays, but like, if you think about it, like, you know, there is always going to be a predetermined number of outcomes, yep. you know, like you can't sit down with the author of the choose your own adventure book and have them just keep writing for you. It's like, sorry, this book's <laughs> 215 pages long. You know what yeah. I mean? Like you, you same thing is true for video games. And it's, it's funny because I will, it's interesting. My wife gave me some advice after a session once. She's like, I need you to think about, um, she's like, think about the games that you play because we had a particular encounter with an, and this is new DM experience. They had a particular encounter with an important NPC, and um, I played that NPC like really reserved, kept things really close to the vest, was very cagey about things, Mm -hmm. and I realized afterwards that I was too much so. Like it was a pointless encounter because they couldn't get anything from it essentially, and it wasn't like it was locked behind a roll. I just kind of like. I had an idea of how it should go, which is never how you should DM. Um, <laughs> but I also was like, when I was kind of creating this character, I was like, okay, this NPC is reserved. This NPC is guarded. This NPC is scared. And this NPC is not going to just like hand over information to total strangers or even want to interact with them. And it's like, well, she she told me she's like go to your video games and think about like those dialogues that you go through like we need a little bit more to go off of like have some preset ideas on what to do i think that's why in a lot of the pre-written modules they, they'll regularly hit you with like what is so and so no and it's like mm-hmm. bullet points of like boom 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 yeah um that's i mean that's so. a thing that i'm still trying to get better at I think I've certainly gotten better at it from the first campaign I ran, but yeah, that's tough because like some, some NPCs, you want them to not, you obviously don't want to be like, Oh, hi, I'm the the guy that you need to get all this information from. Here it is. Go about your business. Yeah, Yeah. Yeah, Uh, exactly. But you also don't want to be like you said, like you don't want them to be so guarded that you came to see them and then they give you nothing and then you're stuck. Right. And the, I mean, like I said, it's something I'm still working on doing, but I, the way I try to do it is try to think of, um, sort of threads that, that the NP, that your, that your PCs would bite on. And if they're not, if they're not interacting with the NPC in a way naturally that is going to have them give information, you can have them just like drop a little nugget that one of your PCs is going to pick up on, hopefully. Mm -hmm. And they'll be like, Oh, Hey, I've done that. And they're like, and then immediately there, there's some rapport so they can open up a little bit. (laughs) Yeah, totally. And it's not easy because you want to make your NPCs also dynamic and variable. You know what I mean? Like not everybody they meet is going to be a signpost of information. It's like, so um, it's, it's one of those things where it's, trying to find that balance is is tough because when it works out it's so satisfying but whenever you have an idea of a way that something should go and it doesn't Mm -hmm. go that way it's if it's it's difficult for me to stay as flexible as i want it to be (laughs) right yeah agreed 100 percent agreed because i like i have Um, whenever i set up do preparation for a, a session i have like all these variables like sort of mapped out to a certain degree mm-hmm. to where I can go quickly. But yeah, like <laughs> invariably you guys will do something that I didn't account for. And I'll be like, okay, we're going this way. <laughs> All right. Like whenever you guys decided you guys. to, uh, whenever you guys decided to take the pirate boat and you rolled like a nat 20 on the persuasion or whatever the hell it was. I was like, mm-hmm. fuck. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I got to roll with it. And sometimes that was, that was one of those things that was super rewarding because the dice told us to do it. Yeah, absolutely. Which is so, it's very terrifying in a way. Like, <laughs> cause you do put a lot of time and effort in, you know, as a DM and it's just like, I, 
I get excited about what I've prepared. Mm-hmm. You know, and it's like, I think this is potentially really cool. But if they want to go a different way, then that's fine. It's just like, okay, we got to pivot. So I heard some <laughs> de- I heard some advice once that was like, that seems really sound. It's like, don't plan uh, like storylines, plan circumstances. Like, that's what I like about this campaign too that you've developed is that like there is not a very clear uh, plot structure, if you will. You know? yes, it's because we're not playing familiar. a video game. Yeah. <laughs> like all you've done is like you've created a world and like there is conflict and strife and circumstance going in in it. And like we we can choose to engage or not. And it's funny because like our group of players, like there was, we happened to experience an assassination. The only problem was that none of us, like all of our PCs were like, Oh, Oh no. Somebody (laughs) that we hate was like killed too bad. (laughs) We all have a very antagonistic or neutral relationship towards this, like, organization and so it's like well sucks for them you know <laughs> but yeah and um, that's, that comes back to, to to using mechanics for storytelling is that the aegis is just a big mechanic that i decided to use as yeah. a storytelling device it's basically to keep it's basically so that magic isn't stupid right yeah <laughs> yeah which i mean if you think about it like i heard this the other day like uh, somebody uh I get sucked into YouTube shorts. I think his name is monkey DM. And he brought this idea up as like a mini campaign or just like a thing. The idea that with a long rest characters completely recover from their wounds. And he was just like, think about how weird that is like an overnight (laughs) circumstance. You can just like, Hey, we survived a gruesome battle yesterday. I'm at seven out of 104 HP or whatever. And as long as I get eight hours of sleep in the morning, I'm tip top. <laughs> um, and he kind of, it was an interesting concept. He's like, yeah, drop your characters in a foreign land. They've been playing for a while in this very D and D world. And it's still like same kind of setting or whatever, but have them survive some harrowing encounter. And then the next day, like, Hey, the heroes of the kingdom or whatever, like you're more than welcome to recover here in our castle. The next day after this gruesome battle, they're tip top shape and like he sets it up that the mage like the, the monarch like is curious about that power. Like that that <laughs> power doesn't exist in that realm. And so they're like, We're gonna find out how you do this and like dissect you, cut you up and <laughs> like can we can we take that? Because that would be obviously amazing. <laughs> you know like hospital stays would always be guaranteed to last one day <laughs> yeah yeah that's 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 another one of those like that's and when you look into mechanics you start to feel like that is weird how can i tell a story with that yeah. <laughs> and that's one of those things uh and in michael's campaign it's it, it's like it so in my campaign there are some circumstances like walking all day that if you take your overnight rest then you only get a short rest yeah and in Michael's campaign, it's even more brutal than that. Like <laughs> uh, to sort of well, and, talk about that specific mechanic. Yeah. It, it highlights the fact that this game was designed like as far as rules, rules were more designed for combat than role playing and the social element. Mm-hmm. Not that they don't exist. It just, I think that there's clearly Wait, that's the reason that like you can play a three hour session and if you have a combat encounter, it's going to take half of it, yep. even though that time is less than a minute on average, yeah. less than half is... a minute on average. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. In game time, it's going to take you 90 minutes to complete this combat if it's an intensive one or an hour. Or whatever, right. Yeah. Um, I wanted to do one more example of how your mechanics can dictate your character's story. Okay. Um, let's roll the dice again to come up with uh, class subclass, and then I would like to 
for those of you that aren't cowards and are true heroes and roll your stats rather than taking the standard array, <laughs> shot, shots fired uh, at anybody that plays it. Standard array is fine. I just... <laughs> Mankind has always loved rolling clickety clacky shiny things that have a random outcome. <laughs> so, um, let's do this one more time. Okay, we're gonna do. We'll do a D twelve. Two. So that Lord. is bard. Oof. I've never played a bard, so this will be fun. <laughs> They have eight. One, two, three. Oh, again, eight. Perfect. <laughs> eight colleges. And this one matters a little less. Um, number seven, College of Valor. Okay. Are you fairly familiar with this one? Um, let's see. So, yeah, this is, I mean, this is one of the, one of the combat ones. This is one of the martial ones, essentially. Okay, cool. So then what I want to do is I'm just going to really quickly roll a set um so we got a 10 we're rolling stats traditional method 46 and you take the highest of the three right uh, yeah uh well 10 six sorry drop, go the, ahead. drop the lowest right drop the lowest that's yeah. right dude this is turning out wild okay i got 10 16 10 10 14 and 16 <laughs> <laughs> okay so there's uh, you said four tens three tens three tens a 14 and two 16s okay 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 and i'll tell you this a roll i mean this is how home, homebrew nonsense for me i've given all of my players the option to take an 18 if they take a six <laughs> Because I, I want them to bounce out. I'm beginning to regret it a little bit because, like, man, giving somebody a plus five potentially is. Yeah. I, they, been, I don't know. Oh, man, I've been thinking about the standard. I think, I think that. I think I would like the standard array if it was. Because it's what, seven, 16? What is it, 15? What is it, where does it start? I don't I'll tell you. 8, 10, 12, 13, 14, 15. Yeah, so I would prefer if it was, instead of a 15, it was a 16 and take a point away from one of the middle ones, I think. Okay, so that you can have an even... Well, just would because... Would be a plus 3? It, well, it would probably be a plus 4, because you're likely going to take a race that gives you oh, plus 2 and whatever. Oh, race that gives you points, yeah, yeah, absolutely. But I don't like the idea of starting level one with plus five and something. Yeah. Yeah. But if it's plus it. four and eventually you can, you can get to once you level four, then you can go ahead and bump it up, which I guess yeah. is the same reasoning for like, you have to be level eight before you get five and something. Eh, I don't, that seems like, that seems like a lot for most campaigns. If yeah. you're starting at three. Right. I don't know. And frankly, if you're running into issues where it's like, oh, okay, my three PCs have a 20, um, I'm just going to beef up the AC of all of my monsters at that point to like yeah, try and yeah. balance it out a little bit. Yeah. Like yeah, everything just... gets plus two to their AC at that point. Yeah. Which, I mean, but... it feels necessary, but it also feels bad as a DM. You're like, huh, yeah. okay. <laughs> I can't hey. have you just run through everything. <laughs> right. Totally. Um. Anyway, back to this. I went ahead and rolled another set just to kind of illustrate a better example of what I would want to talk about. So I've got lowest to highest. 7, 9, 11, 13, 14, 16. Okay. And so with a bard, optimally, you're going to toss your highest score into charisma, right? Yeah. Um, and then, like what I wanted to talk about with this as an example is the, like every, almost every class is going to have a dump stat, right? Right. And 
you're playing with your friends, you're going around the table. It's like, oh, you know, like I'm the barbarian, but I have to make an investigation check because I asked a question that was going to prompt an investigation role. But <laughs> haha, I'm dumb. I'm just bad. I'm just bad at that, right? Uh-huh. I just wanted to use this to kind of highlight, like, no, no, like make that a part of your character's experience and choice, right? So, um, for example, for this bard, College of Valor, like we've got a 16 in Charisma. What's the dump stat for bards typically? I would imagine. I mean, strength is like the dump stat for just about everyone that does that isn't everything. a barbarian, yeah. right? <laughs> Even yeah. for fighters sometimes and paladins, you can dump strength, depending on what you're making. Yeah. But like, let's say that that is the case. Like, I, I would encourage players to like identify. It's like, okay, why is your College of Valor bard not like necessarily strong? Like less less strong than average, right? Like, what's the what's the commoner stat block? Let's look that up. <laughs> this should be interesting. Yeah, and for for Valor, maybe you go, maybe you dump make your intelligence your dump stat, right? Maybe okay. Because Valor specifically is a fight, is a martial. Like you get two attacks right. later. And maybe, maybe, yeah, you're not fighting with a dex based weapon. Yeah. And yeah, a commoner is a 10 across the board. Like yeah. you are literally weaker than the common the, person. The average Joe. <laughs> yeah. It's like, yeah, this farmer could beat me in a hands. Uh, uh, what arm, wrestling. Called? arm wrestling. <laughs> yeah. He can beat me in hands. <laughs> <laughs> okay, clearly, int is my dumb stat. <laughs> you, beat, you beat me at the hand game. <laughs> Anywho, like with this, let's say it is strength. Like it is for my character in our campaign. Like I've got the sorcerer again, going back to that. And strength was my dumb stat. And I have a minus one in it, I think. And I always kind of envisioned that, like, my character was kind of the runt of the family a little bit. Like, he's very lithe and very, like, yeah, this kid could, um, I mean, he's got, he could swim across the channel of where he's locally from. But don't ask him to carry, like, several boxes onto the boat, basically, you know? Yeah. And, it's... and I always kind of had that in my mind for him specifically in his story. Yeah, and that's kind of uh, it's a little bit of a roadblock for for making some characters because mm-hmm. no one's ever going to make Dex their dump stat, right? Yeah, because if Dex is your dump stat, you're going to get hit by everything that looks at you, and that's not yeah. fun. And it's also not right. fun for your companions who are like, uh, "He's down again." <laughs> yeah. So that's a bit yeah. of a roadblock there. I mean, you could maybe make the case that like you could there and there are certain classes that that swap out decks for something else for your ac but mm-hmm. yeah so that's it's you also have, ugh, you have to you still have to find that balance to work within the rules to be you don't have to be min maxed but it's better right. to not be if you're so far into the story that your character dies yeah then your story's over anyway. <laughs> uh, yeah. I, yeah. And if anything, you know, it's more so just like, Hey, have a reason for some of these choices that you're making, you know? Yeah. Absolutely. Like, uh, you know, like, and uh, break, break some of those norms, you know, like if you, if you're playing a barbarian and you made it, your dump, you've got a minus two and in like, it doesn't have to be just this like dumb guy, but maybe you could be like, no, like actually my barrier, my barbarian is like, it's even one of the common flavor things in the book. I think it talks about how they're kind of like hermits and on their own. It's just like literally my barbarian grew up in the wild and never learned how to read. It doesn't mean he's an, it just means that like intellectually, he's just not there or whatever. Right. Yeah. And that's one of those things like that. I've even been, sort of <laughs> over the past decade learning in real life is that there are different types of intelligence. Yeah, and it's, absolutely. Nowhere is it better displayed than in D and D where you can have a really high charisma or wisdom score, but a low intelligence yeah. score. And all that means is like, if you have a high wisdom score and a low intelligence score, that might mean that you're not great at like piecing together things through critical thinking. 
but yes. you can look at someone and sort of get an idea of what kind of person they are. Absolutely. <laughs> like, and that, I mean, for me, it's just like, Hey, explore that. Cause that would be, that would be an enjoyable and meaningful, like story to pull on. You know what I mean? That kind of makes up the framework of your character. Mm-hmm. So and that's, this, that's part of role playing for me is like yeah. finding these little, uh, bits of myself that I can amplify to play a character. Like I, I can explore Absolutely. this within myself through this character that I created. So I'm, I'm thinking about this particular bard college of valor mm-hmm. and he's got a seven and something and kind of reading about this kind of stuff. They do get proficiencies in things like medium armor, shields, martial weapons, their extra thing. They get an extra attack and so maybe I've rolled these things and okay, yeah, like bards typically make strength or dump stats. It's like, well, okay, maybe just based off of this, I've decided I'm going to roll with this flavor. And instead I'm going to make int or I'm going to make uh, wisdom or I'm going to make, you know, I don't know why you would want to do this, but you could just be like, you know what? Maybe I'm going to play. So for example, this flavor text, uh, bards of college valor are daring scalds whose tales keep alive the memory of the great heroes of the past um, these bards gather in mead halls around great bonfires. Uh, I, I, I kind of am envisioning like, okay, this has got some like Nordic vibes to it. I'm going to make the dump stat for this con because like, Hey, he's a part of this clan or whatever. And there's a reason that he's a bard instead of a barbarian. He's got some kind of sickly disease from birth. <laughs> that literally yeah. makes it and so maybe this isn't going to make it super fun to play potentially if your con is your dump stat or whatever but it is something that i'm going to just like think about it's just like okay yeah like maybe if i do that i'm going to give it a reason as to why i did that you know or if it's just like no i'm going to go with the typical min maxing thing i'm going to make strength the dump stat because that's what you're supposed to do well think about why strength for this particular guy could be the dump stat you know it's like why is he bad at moving rocks real good or whatever. <laughs> so. Yeah. And, or if, if you were to go with int as the dump stat, you could make it like, you know, he wasn't none of, no one in his clan is particularly bright. So it's not sure. It's not a comp. It's not a common thing or it's like, <clears throat> yeah, I've, you know, had a trouble with, <laughs> with figuring out how to like make, pulleys and, and wheels happen but <laughs> i could tell a really good story and everyone likes me so <laughs> yeah or like i mean you know bard this is getting very stereotypical which is like okay my bard's gonna play an instrument int is my dump stat though and it's like you know what he can't read music but he's learned to play by ear yeah, you know what i mean know. like he doesn't he doesn't know any of the definitions for musical theory but like he can like hey i've managed to kind of pluck this out and figure it out i could like if you play me, like, he wouldn't even know to call it this, but it's like, if you can play me four measures, like, I can give it right back to you immediately just by hearing it. Yeah. You know? It's like, that, to me, is kind of cool. It's like, yeah, you know, I've always been kind of good at this, and, like, I'm just already envisioning this story. So it's like, okay, this bard is, like, rough and tumble, uh, raised in some kind of, like, urban urchin, kind of environment and he just was like the likable kid that like they brought to the bar and he always lied about his age to get in or whatever and he would play for the people there it's like he had no technical training whatsoever but just was really good and it's like hey you know like jimbo the whatever like strike us up a tune it's like absolutely (laughs) but if you asked him to find an f like an F major chord, he'd be like, I don't know what that is. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, that the, sound. There you go. Yeah. And the college of valor can just be because that's the people he was around. Right. You could, it, yeah. you don't have to have gone to an actual college, right? You can just use the subclass yeah. and then fill in the subtext for yourself. So yeah, like you were saying, he's part of this, you know, clan and he was never the, the, the meatiest guy. Or the or the smartest, right. he could play well, and because he was in this clan, he learned how to use all these other things, like the weapons and stuff. He's he's totally proficient with them. <laughs> proficient. 
not to say that they're his go-to, but he can right. do it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Cause I mean, proficient could mean a lot of different things, you know? Yeah. So, uh, good stuff. All right. Yeah. We've gone over an hour. I think we're, <laughs> That's probably it, yeah. yeah. This just makes me want to make a new character. <laughs> like, one of my favorite things. It's like, I'm thinking about it. Oh. Yeah, so uh, hopefully this becomes a regular thing where we do this maybe once a week, once every two weeks, something like that. Yeah, But easy peasy. Thanks for chatting with me. Thanks for watching slash listening, everybody. We'll see you next time. Bye. See ya.